Thank you for inviting me here. It is a pleasure to be in a place where spring has actually arrived. I left Boston and last week, and it was just barely getting there, so I've enjoyed my sort of whirlwind tour of California. Let me begin with a couple of practical pointers for those of you with children in the schools. Let me first ask how many have children or grandchildren in the public schools in the area. Just about all of you, that's great. Because you are the people on the front lines who need to be able to see what's going on if you haven't already had a chance and been shocked by what you've seen. First practical pointer, which I now am telling people everywhere, is that parents can opt out if they choose to. They don't need to ask anybody's permission. This is something that all parents have the right to do. Many states are trying to figure out how to pass laws that give parents the right. Well, this is the wrong approach. They already have that right. Any parent, anywhere, unless there's some peculiar statute in state law, has the right to pull out children for any purpose. In the community I've lived in, parents have been taking out kids for 40 years when they wanted to go on a vacation. They just wrote in a little note and told the school that was what they were doing. They don't need to ask permission for that. The other point I've started to make, and Brad and I are going to have to talk probably more about it in detail, is the larger picture for locally elected school boards, because in most cases in our states, all 50, including California, you have locally elected school boards, and a basic political principle in this country since its founding and before is that those are the people, those who are elected by the voters, have the legal authority over what happens in your schools. It hasn't been taken away. There are moves to regionalize control of public education, and those need to be defeated. But those people who are legally elected in an election to make decisions about policy for your local schools are in control of curriculum standards and instruction. The only thing they may have to do is give a state-developed test to the students in the school system, but this doesn't mean that the parents can't take their kids out of that school system. There are some rights that still are there for locally elected school boards. That's where the real battle has to be. And that leads me to what I want to give you as the kind of big picture for who was deliberately excluded from the Common Core project. And I was a part of it in some ways from the very beginning. And you'll hear some more of the gory details, particularly my experience on a bizarre committee called the Validation Committee. But the four major groups who were excluded were, first of all, parents. Parents were the last to find out about what was going to happen with their own children. And they are busily being disengaged, if possible, or shunted off, or in some way alienated from whatever's happening in the schools. In many cases, they're not being told the truth or any information at all. The second group were teachers themselves. Teachers will tell you that they had no idea what was going to happen after their State Board of Education adopted Common Core standards. Third group, very important, are state legislators. I've testified in about 25 states in the past year and a half. And the first question is usually, what is Common Core? They're being hit with bills, usually for the high technology, for the testing, or for professional development for teachers, the two major expenses that are coming down the pike right now. But they were not involved. Their state boards of education didn't bother to ask them for a cost-benefit analysis of what these standards might entail that they were developed, that the state board was planning to adopt. Nor did the state boards ever ask for the teaching faculty in higher education institutions in a state which the state legislature pays for when it subsidizes and appropriates money for its public colleges. 
universities, community colleges, whatever, but they weren't involved in giving any advice to the state boards on what these so-called college readiness standards were all about. So state legislatures were deliberately avoided because what was not desired was public discussion and deliberation about all the questions I had when I was on the state board in Massachusetts during the years Common Core was being developed and then approved. Finally, local school boards or local school committee people were nowhere to be seen on any of the Common Core committees. They were kept in the dark and as I was told in Massachusetts, after the state board adopted Common Core's standards, they were then they officially notified after the fact. They had no idea that there were going to be new standards coming down the pike for them. So the four major groups who should have the most to say about children's education were deliberately avoided by memos of understanding between a governor and either a chair of a board of ed or a commissioner of ed, sometimes both, all three, and then an approval by a board of education at the state level, which has statutory authority to adopt standards that are voluntary for local districts to adopt. And that was true in Massachusetts. We always knew that. Even when I was in the Department of Ed developing K-12 standards, we always knew they were voluntary because of local control. The tests that we would develop based on those standards, which was why we needed to develop them, had to be based legally on these state-developed standards. But those had to be given because that was part of the statutory authority of State Board of Ed and its Department of Ed, which in most states is part of the administrative branch of government. Now, you have a different situation where you have separately elected commissioners, as you do here in California and a few other states, which gives them independence from a governor or from other bodies. But in most states, that's not the case. Let me give you some basic facts about the Common Core development of standards, because it was a stealth operation from the very beginning. And I want you to know why I was so outraged about it to begin with. I was on only the validation committee, which was the final committee that was supposed to approve and endorse these standards. But why I was so concerned about the secrecy, the non-transparency of what this project was all about was a reflection of my own background. I've been a very active citizen in my home community. I was, first of all, president of the League of Women Voters, which was nonpartisan. I understand democratic procedures completely. I was an elected town meeting member for 10 years, and I was a library trustee elected also for 14 years. I know what sunshine laws are about. I know what can be foia Freedom of Information Act, what can't be foia I understand what agendas and minutes of meetings and why you have to have public meetings and how feedback that you get should be available to everybody. I was on a committee where none of that's available for anyone. So I just found the whole lack of transparency extremely puzzling. But let's start at the beginning because that was how the project began and it tells us why we can't get any information about any of the origins of this project to centralize decision making about public education in this country in Washington. And that's how I would describe a major part of the goal uh, ideologically in a sense. Who developed these standards? We all know that private organizations in DC did. They were not state led. This is one of the many lies I've tried to counter, and it's very difficult for me to keep telling people that these are lies, because then I begin to sound like some wild freak. But they were not state-led. They were developed by the National Governors Association, the Council for Chief State School Officers, and Achieve Inc., which is a spin-off of the National Governors Association, all private groups in DC. And they were all funded for this particular purpose by another private organization, the Gates Foundation. All private groups doing whatever they wanted in private 
unaccountable to the public. They never had to tell the public why they chose the people they did to put on these committees, what the charges were to them, can't get a hold of contracts, don't know how much they were paid, nothing. No information is available because they're private. Who selected the members, for example, of the standards development work groups, the people who actually decided what the end goal at the high school level would be, college readiness, and pay attention to the name. We've never had college readiness standards in this country before. No other country has them either. They're not plain old ordinary standards. They're college readiness standards, which is a whole different can of worms, so to speak. But so far as we know, Achieve Inc. and the Gates Foundation selected the personnel to write these high school level college readiness standards. It's the best guess we can come up with because no one's going to admit who actually chose the people on that initial committee. And who were they? That was when I first became rather concerned about what this whole project was going to end up with. They were mainly people connected to our testing industries. ACT, CB, College Board, Achieve, they were mainly people involved in test development or curriculum development. They were not content experts, which is what you would have expected rationally in English language arts or mathematics. Who was not on these groups, because I'm trained as an academic researcher to see what's missing as well as what's there and to analyze both. The people who were not there were high school English and math teachers. The two groups that you would expect to be on a college readiness committee, along with teaching faculty at the college level who teach in those areas. English professors weren't there, scientists, engineers, parents, state legislators, and so forth. None of them were on the committee, the very people you would expect to be on a college readiness committee. Can't get any information about why they were chosen, as I say. That's in the dark. And who were the people chosen to write these standards? And you have to look at them to appreciate the fact, if you know a little bit about math, look at the high school level. There are serious problems there, and I'll go into detail in a few minutes. English is so poorly written that my first reaction is these are people who could never have written English language arts standards because they've never done it before. I have been the editor of a research journal in the English language arts and have done a great deal of writing and I prize good English writing and above all a document that claims to be English language arts standards should be written in good English. It goes without saying that you want not gobbledygook or gibberish. You want something that is clear, interpretable, without a lot of fuzziness, and so on. The two lead writers in English, we know their names, David Coleman, Susan Pimentel, had no qualifications for what they were doing. They had never taught reading or English in K-12 or at the college level. They had not majored in English. They didn't have doctorates in English. They had never published anything on education. They were totally unknown to the field at the time they were appointed. Now, in math, two of the lead writers had PhDs in mathematics, so they knew the subject area. But they, too, had no experience in writing K-12 mathematics standards. The third person on the committee, whose name is Phil Darrow, actually had majored in English. Now, you look at that and you say to yourself, there's some serious issues with credibility. But no reporters, no media ever picked up. Who were these people? Why were they chosen? The media have been out to lunch. There are some serious problems with the training of reporters and other journalists in this country. But it certainly shows up with their failure to say, who were these people chosen? Why were they chosen? And what were their credentials for doing what they did. What was the ostensible purpose of this validation committee that I was on? Now, what is the committee's function? Validation committee sounds rather impressive. It was to ensure that the standards were 
internationally benchmarked, research-based, and rigorous, among other things. But those were the major focuses for this committee. And the validation committee was selected by the very group developing the standards, which was another violation of a very fundamental rule, is that if you want to have something evaluated, you don't choose the people who developed what it was that's to be evaluated. And Common Core people chose the validation committee. USAD could have chosen people from abroad or at our universities or elsewhere. They didn't. So Common Core chose its own validation committee. Now, people have asked me how I got on the committee, given how critical I became, and I'm sure since then they have regretted deeply having me on the committee, <laughs> since I've been writing for five years against Common Core. But I was on the State Board of Education. I was known for what I had done in Massachusetts, and Mitchell Chester, who was at that time, and still is, the Commissioner of Education in Massachusetts, kind of owed me a favor because I had been on the search committee that had hired him for his position. So I nagged him because I wanted to be on the final committee for these standards. Every week I would call Mitchell, and every week Mitchell would call Washington. Is Stotsky going to get on the validation committee? And finally, the day before the books were closed, I got on. They could not resist his entreaties because they wanted Massachusetts on board. Massachusetts was to be the official sacrificial lamb. We were one of the states with the best sets of standards, the highest records for our kids on all of the national and some international tests. And if Massachusetts adopted Common Core, then a whole bunch of other commissioners would immediately follow suit. That was the plan. And we knew that that was the plan by the time we were in the year where Common Core was being developed. What was the real purpose of this committee? It was to rubber stamp what I just told you, that they were internationally benchmarked, rigorous, and research-based. They were none of the above, of course. So five of us on the committee, including James Milgram, who was a professor of mathematics here at Stanford University, and we became very friendly during the course of that year, trying to figure out what was going on on this committee. But we, he looked at math, I looked at ELA, they weren't internationally benchmarked, and they weren't rigorous. And I'll tell you some of the details about the math standards that I have learned from Professor Milgram. But the point was that we couldn't sign off, and three others couldn't sign off. Why the others did is something you would have to figure out for yourself by looking at who they are, what kind of grants they get, where they get grant money from, and what kind of business they do. So it gives you a clue about why some of the people validated these standards. But they are not validated, by the way, which is another legal issue that you have to keep in mind. They're not internationally benchmarked because we've never gotten the names of the countries to which they're benchmarked. I kept asking. <laughs> Could never get the names of the countries, either in math or in English. And they're not research-based because I knew all the research. They are not rigorous at all. In fact, that's been the sales pitch to sort of get people off base. They are so far from rigorous that we figured out, Jim and I independently, that it's going to lower the academic level of our high school by about two grades worth. Yep. They go with a little proviso that is, if you pass a college readiness test to be given in grade 11 in most places, you therefore are entitled to credit-bearing courses at the college level. That was the connection. They were college readiness standards. If you pass them in grade 11, and we don't know where the cut score or passing score is going to be yet, tests haven't been finished, and I can't tell you any more about them because we don't know where the cut score is going to be. It could be about grade 8 or 9 level. But they will be entitled, anyone who passes this test and gets into a college, that accepts them, wants to go to college, will be able to take credit-bearing courses. They cannot be required to take remediation. Now, as Milgram says, what is that going to mean for the math courses that now a lot of students take for remediation? If the colleges want to have the number of 
tuition paying students there, if presidents are under pressure to make sure they have the bodies of people there that will give them their money from state appropriations, they're going to lower the level of those math courses to possibly, in some cases, intermediate algebra. That's college ready, depending upon level of the college readiness test. Could I ask, by the way, if someone can wave when I have five minutes left? I don't know who's going to be timekeeper. Just let me know. Uh, Joan, are you the one? You'll let me know. Fine. I forgot to clarify that because I can speak for hours and <laughs> just need to know when to turn off. We don't mind sitting here. <laughs> no, but I don't want to deprive you of your time. So why did Massachusetts then, and I was on the Board of Education at the time, and I'll go into the flaws for the English language arts standards in a few minutes. Why did Massachusetts agree to dump its own very good ELA standards, and California's were, by the way, just as good, if not better. We were promised $250 million in race to the top money. We got it. Governor Patrick was a friend of President Obama, and we were promised $250 million in race to the top money. So that was, who could turn that down? The commissioner couldn't turn it down, and the Board of Ed was told this was what we were going to get if we committed ourselves to adopting Common Core Standards. And indeed, there were several reports that were produced by different groups that were all funded by the Gates Foundation. One was from Achieve, another was from Fordham Institute, another was from WestEd, that was money that was laundered through the Hunt Institute in North Carolina, we could figure out and trace a third of a million dollars, that the Massachusetts Business Alliance in Education, which is a group in Massachusetts, was to get for commissioning a report from WestEd to compare Massachusetts standards to Common Core's. And of course, all these groups funded by the Gates Foundation came up with the non-remarkable conclusion that there wasn't much difference, that Massachusetts would do just about as well with Common Core as it was doing with its own standards. So that was the end of that. The Boston Globe went happily along. Here are four reports, all saying X, Y, and Z. Who cares that they're all funded by the Gates Foundation? And so we dumped our good standards. Californias in math and science were even better you have lost the two sets of what were called gold standard standards in this country when your Board of Education adopted Common Core. Your math and science standards were considered the best in the country. Your ELA were among the best, and you have gone down about at least two grades worth. What are some of the big issues? First of all, in math, let me hit some of the math deficiencies, which Professor Milgram has been able to point out. He and I were on the validation committee. He was the only mathematician on the validation committee. All the others who are, were all constantly told, oh, there were eight other math experts. They were all in schools of education. They had doctorates in math education or curriculum instruction. He was the only mathematician, and he was the only one who could read the high school math standards. I can't read them. And it takes somebody who's either an engineer, a scientist, or a mathematician, computer science, to be able to read the high school math science standards. As he has pointed out, and we wrote a paper together last year, coming out from the Pioneer Institute, you can't get to Calculus I from the weak Algebra II course that is there in Common Core. The weak Algebra II standards leave out, according to him, several critical components of Algebra II that would enable students to do a trigonometry course successfully or a pre-calculus course successfully. But there are no pre-calculus standards in Common Core, and there aren't many trig courses. So he said you can't even get from A to B. Now, that is deliberate because we had Jason Zimba visiting the Massachusetts Board of Education in March. We have a video up there on the website. I asked him, describe what college readiness means in math. And he said, it won't prepare kids for STEM majors. He's the math writer. He's a PhD in math. He knows what he's talking about. 
Why? We don't know. Nobody's given us an official explanation. Why aren't those standards there? We didn't ask for them to be required for graduation diploma. They just should be there as they were in the old California standards. You had a set of pre-calc standards. They're gone. And we do know that the AP calculus course that comes from College Board is probably going to be discontinued in a few years because as Trevor Packard, the vice president of the College Board has says, has already indicated, AP calculus doesn't fit into the Common Core math sequence. He didn't say anything more about it, but the inference that can be drawn is that in a few years, once we get rid of those pesky parents whose children are in line to take AP calculus in 11 or 12, uh, nobody else is going to be prepared for it, so they're not going to be able to offer it. It'll just disappear. He said we might want to go to an AP algebra course. And of course, that is one of the other deficiencies in math, the deferral of full algebra one course for its completion to grade nine. Now, we have heard from proponents of Common Core who will say, oh, there are algebra standards in grade eight. Yes, there are, but you can't complete it in grade eight. That was deliberate. You have to complete it in grade nine, which means you can never get to the highest level math and science courses by grade 11 or 12. Now, what is missing in ELA, or what are the problems there? First of all, ELA consists mainly of skills. It's not content. And skills have no necessary grade level. So it's up to the test developers to decide what level and what passages. Yes, there are some examples of <clears throat> grade appropriate titles in what is called Appendix B, but the range is so great that there's no way you can pinpoint any particular grade level at any one grade level. So it's going to be a developer's choice. And that's why you have to wait, if you want to, until you actually can see the test, which is another issue. You'll never be able to see the test. Unlike many states which required release of items, Common Cores will not be publicly released. And that's another issue for you to think about, that parents and others will never know what was on the test that their kids took, nor will teachers know either. And in many states, Rhode Island teacher just told me that a few weeks ago, they are being sworn to secrecy. She was terrified, she told me. She said, before we gave our practice test, we were all told to sign a confidentiality agreement. We couldn't speak to parents about what we saw happening in our classrooms. We couldn't let kids' comments be relayed anywhere. We can't talk to anybody about anything relating to the tests. And indeed, I forgot to mention that on the validation committee, we were told in order to be on the validation committee, we had to sign confidentiality agreements. We could, for the rest of our lives, never tell anybody about what happened or didn't happen on that committee. Let's get back to math. One more point, because Euclidean geometry is being taught by a very experimental, untested method. That was put in there, and most high school teachers are not prepared to teach it. They're trying to get rid of it if they can, but it's not easy if the standards are there. But it's an approach to geometry that Milgram will tell you was tried in the old Soviet Union, didn't work there, and they got rid of it. It's now for the entire country here. In ELA, we have an additional problem beside the skills, and I'm going to go faster now. We have an emphasis on writing that makes no sense over reading. I don't know how many of you have noticed how much writing kids are being expected to do, not only in ELA, but in math. They're turning math into a semi-language arts course. Kids have to write out long explanations of why certain things are there in math. No one's saying kids shouldn't understand what they're doing in math, but this is going to be a problem 
for ESL students and for a lot of young boys who do not like to write a lot in math because they can do other things in math. It's been one of their strengths. It will no longer be one of their strengths. So we have those two problems plus a third problem, which is reduction of literary study, increase in something called informational text, which is flooding, opening a floodgate for all kinds of stuff that many parents are very upset about when they see what kinds of selections are there. But the reduction in literary study should be of great concern because that is where analytical reading and writing come from. Teachers teach kids how to read between the lines of complex literary texts. So if you reduce literary study to about 50% of the English class, you're reducing opportunities for learning how to do analytical reading and writing. Those are the main things. Those of you who want more details can go to my writings, which are available on my homepage at the University of Arkansas. You just Google Sandra Stotsky, Arkansas. It'll pop up, and you'll see all the things that I've been writing as testimony, other articles, and you can get more details on any of this. But I would like to suggest that what parents could try to start to do in communities like this, which are high-achieving communities, is think about, and this is what I want Brad and I to talk about a little bit more. Remember, these are called college readiness standards. Well, if most of your kids have been going to college already, why do you need college readiness standards? Your kids have passed them. Get rid of them. Go back to your old California standards and declare yourself exempt. What are they going to do? I don't know what they can do. Send out the National Guard, <laughs> arrest you. I don't know what they would do. We'd, we haven't had any test cases. But if your students have already gone on to college and you've got empirical data from the records, then you don't need college readiness standards to prepare kids for college. They're already there. That tells you right there that they're not rigorous. They're to prepare kids for going to college. They're dumbing your whole curriculum down. They're not the curriculum, but the curriculum will address standards your kids don't need. They're past those standards. So you've got to make your argument logically and then see where it goes. The bureaucrats are going to back off because they have no statutory language to back them up. That's all I'm going to say now, but you can have questions for later on. I just want to make sure that Lydia has enough time and Brad for what they're going to offer you right now. Thank you very much. <laughs>